Welcome to Tip TV Education with uh, Corbin Cordela, who is uh, the head of Tip TV Education. How are you today, Corbin? Very good. Thank you for having me on. Right. Uh, we're going to our chosen subject today is risk reward in trading. How to really measure performance? A bit intriguing as a title, I would suggest. It really, in a nutshell, boils down to the fact that when people talk about how they should put on a trade, they talk about stop losses, take profits, and there's this preconceived notion that I should trade a risk reward of two to one, three to one, four to one. And the big problem with that is you're going into a trade believing the market will give you something, and the market usually doesn't do that. And so there is a dissonance between reality and what you believe reality should give you. And so the question is, how should you really approach that? How should you really measure the amount of risk you're taking? And then compare it to what the industry does. I mean, in the end, anybody would want to benchmark themselves against the best players out there. And the idea really is about, am I doing well? Am I not doing well? How should I measure myself? And ultimately, how much risk should I be running on the stuff that I'm doing? OK, well, let's have a look at uh, what your answer may be here. So in a nutshell, I chose this quote from Alice in Wonderland, which is a famous one, about if you really don't know where you're going, you're in the end not going to end up there. And it goes back to this idea that setting a risk reward into the ground as a line is not sufficient. And just because you put your take profit five times your stop loss away, doesn't mean you're gonna get there. And then people all of a sudden get surprised, well, why was I stopped out? Why am I not making the money? Are the signals right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So how should I really measure risk versus reward? And um, is this you learn from, from hedge funds or looking at hedge funds? Well, it's really going down the route of how do the professionals do it? So from an investment management point of view, one of the very first questions you get asked is, what is your sharp ratio? And so there's a list of measures that are listed on the next slide, yeah. but there are far many and really it's just an overview. But the key concept here is, risk versus reward, and the sharp ratio is the standard measure. And the way you think about that is, how much do I earn for every dollar that I risk? So if I risk one dollar, how much can I expect to make back? And the answer is, if you're performing well within the industry, then the sharp ratio of one is considered good and above average. Um, if you're earning a sharp ratio of two, so for every dollar you risk, you make two dollars, you're considered stellar. Anything above two, you're walking on water. And you need to set this in perspective because it goes back to this message that I keep on giving. It's about the market tends to pay you for an edge that you identify. As a personal investor, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to use rocket science, and you don't have to find the shiniest new toy. The classic example is, and I think I said that last time, who purchased here the S&P 500 back in 1993 and just held on to it and leveraged up the wazoo, not many people. But the point is the markets will pay you. So it's always interesting to go back to what is the sharp ratio of the market, let's say the equity market, because people are familiar with that. And there over the long term, it's of the order of 0 0.5, 0 0.6. For every dollar I risk, I make 60 cents mm -hmm. back, which is actually a very good number over the long term. And with the right amount of leverage, you can make tremendous amounts of money. So again, the point is, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to make money, but you need to measure your performance in the right way. And the sharp ratio tends to be that. There are some issues here, however, which is that the sharp ratio, what it doesn't do, it doesn't ask what's your maximum possible loss. And I think a lot of people in the 2008 equity crash really didn't expect a 50% drawdown. Look what happened in 1987. A lot of people got wiped out then. And 1929, of course, is the classic example. So not just about how much money can I make, I also must be mindful of the fact how much can I potentially lose as my maximum loss. And that's a, another very important question to ask. And what you tend to find is when investors come to you to invest money and you talk to them, they probably say 10% is the number that I'm happy with. But as we said last time, you're even down 3 or 4%, the first thing that happens is the phone starts to ring. So it's really understanding yourself and uh, how much in the end you're really willing to risk. Yeah, but isn't the problem with the, with the nature of the markets is that you never really know how much you're risking? No, you don't. But that then requires you to superimpose your own risk preference upon the market. And that's where stop losses come in. And stop losses, I think we said last time, aren't really there to enable you to make more money, but by the very nature of allowing you to understand where your floor is and the amount you're able to lose, 
you understand how much you can then leverage up. Because in the end, it's about making money and it's not just about preserving your capital. Okay, well, uh, I think the, the next slide is uh, an eye opener of, of sorts, uh, looking at the greats. Well, so let me go through the three systems here, the three strategies or three hedge funds, if you wish. The first one, Berkshire Hathaway, of course, stands for Buffett. It's his holding company, and he's a value investor in the equity markets. So what we list here in terms of Sharpe ratio, it's 0.54 over the long run, since we have uh, his historical data for that share of Yahoo Finance, compared to the S&P 500. So actually, they perform very close, except, of course, he will use higher leverage and be more selective. And Let's go back to risk and how much people are willing to lose. So the S&P, as we know, did crash 50% back in 2008, and et cetera. But Buffett in the last 20 years also experienced 50% drawdowns, 1998, where he missed out on the tech bubble, and of course, 2008 again. But he made it all back and more on top. So why am I highlighting this? Because a lot of people believe that you have to go into trading, and you have to churn out money consistently every day every day, every week, every month. And if you have a losing period, oh my God, it's the end of the world and you're not really up to it. And that's not true. If that were the case, there wouldn't be any hedge funds around, there wouldn't be any investment professionals around, et cetera, et cetera. The turtle system is actually very interesting. And if people recall, there was a guy called Richard Dennis, also called Prince of the Pits, who in the 70s or late 60s managed to turn $400 famously into $200 million over a period of 10, 15 years. And he was a trend follower, traded the futures markets by looking at momentum and following the trend, let the trend be your friend. And he's got a sharp ratio, which actually is twice as high as the equity markets. And his compound annual growth rate, well, that depends on the amount of leverage that he chooses to use. But the highlight here is, again, that trend following has been around with us for centuries, as some people would claim. And it pays you on a consistent basis, keeps on paying you. And again, you're paid to take the sweat of buying at the top. In essence. And buying at the top, of course, is always a puke trade. You know, the one where you feel incredibly ill to do it. It probably will ca cause you the most amount of pain doing it. But at that time when it causes you the most amount of pain to do it, that's also when you get paid the most. You know, famously, people um, say that you should always buy. I think Buffett said that you should always buy when there's blood on the streets. And certainly in 2008, that was an example when had you come in at that magic number 666 in March of 2009, you would have made tons of money by now. And that's certainly what a trend following system does advocate. Um, the purpose of this table really is to highlight that you're going to lose money when you trade. Depending on the amount of risk you want to take, you can lose a lot of money, 50%. You must be prepared for that. But the rewards are absolutely tremendous and phenomenal. Um, which goes counter this idea of what people try to sell, that trading should be seen as an income generation. You know, what's income generation is something that's guaranteed. It's like buying a bond well, or yeah, having a job. And then to go on to the lower part of the slide, you've got, you know, you're supposed to be not betting more than 2% of your capital. Well, there's, no, there's no stress involved at all. That, well, 2% it, you can lose five times in a row. It's like, who cares? Well, yes, but then, of course, it's about the frequency or the number of trades that you put on. And remember that, and this is interesting, this goes back to Paul Tudor Jones, the way he approaches the markets is that I put on a position a week ago or yesterday, it makes a lot of money, I come in the next day, I don't consider the money I've made paper, fictional money. It's actually real money in the bank. So the next day, and this definitely happens in trend following systems, people have made a ton of money the previous day, then they spank it all away. So your actual fluctuations can be quite big. And from your peak, you can actually incur quite a big loss. And trends tend to be like that. They, the whole point about trends is they go up parabolic. They go up like a rocket. It's very difficult to forecast when they finish. And then they'll collapse and drop off a cliff. So you can lose 10, 15, 20%. It can be painful. The purpose is about trading not to just protect your capital, but to also protect your profits. Um, I think the biggest counter argument or the biggest complaint that people have of not risking more than 1% you say, well, how can I possibly make money? So if we go to the next slide, this is an example of the turtle system actually applied recently over the last two years. As you can see, 2015 was a so-and-so year. 2014 actually was a big, big winner because of the trends in the um, second half of the year. <laughs> had you actually applied a 2% risk, you would have had the results in the bottom right-hand corner, making no money at all because of the whipsaw of the market. <laughs> And this is something that's really been occurring over the last 20 years. By reducing your risk, you would have reduced the amount of whipsaw that you had, and you would have made money. And I think, I believe the last two, three months for a trend followers have been actually quite, 
quite well. And so the curve here on the top left hand chart should be going up. So it's really about not going into the markets and expecting that just because I put in a five to one risk reward, I'll get money. It's about understanding how did your system behave historically. That'll tell you how much you can expect to make from your system, from your decision making process. And that will in the end ultimately inform you where you should put your take profits and your stop losses. So you need to let the market teach you rather than going and imposing your will upon the market. The minute you do that, you're going to get taken to the cleanest. Right. Okay. Well, that, uh, that's a sobering thought. Um, the call to action. The call to action here is to go to my website, which is over here, fxmastercourse.com, and to sign up to my newsletter. Um, you will get weekly articles on market dynamics, insights. They tend to be quite and very interesting, very different from what you tend to get on other websites. Um, but the purpose here is to really highlight the fact, again, the message that by understanding the edge and by applying the right risk and leverage, you can hit it out of the ballpark. And edge here doesn't mean the shiniest new toy. It really is about what pays me in the market. And since we're focusing on the FX market, the things that pay us are interest rates, value, and momentum. And actually going to interest rates, of course, what happened this week was very interesting in terms of Yellen's dovishness. And that more or less put a halt on dollar appreciation. At the same time, the previous week, Draghi goes and says, you know, this is it. I've got the floor. And your dollar at the moment is doing only one thing it can do on the back of the interest rate differential not expanding any further in favor of the dollar. It's going back up. And I wouldn't be surprised given that on a PPP adjusted basis, it's at 124 according to the OECD. That'll go back up to 120 over the next three, four months. Ouch is the word, I think, if you're uh, Mario Draghi in that scenario. But uh, Corbin Cordela, uh, Tip TV Education, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that's it for the show. We'll see you again next time.